Formula One cars are designed to push the rules as far as possible, and over the years there have been some crazy looking cars in pursuit of maximum performance. Designers are always finding genius ways to sidestep FIA restrictions to create the fastest cars possible, and sometimes the results are insane, and sometimes downright ugly. But how did we end up with these really ugly cars? And what was the reason behind some of the ugliest F1 cars ever made? As we know, the design of a Formula 1 car is entirely defined by regulations. They restrict the dimensions of the car and dictate the space that designers can work with. And over the years, designers have found genius loopholes through the rules, meaning the rules have got stricter and stricter to stop the designs getting out of hand. Back in 1983, the FIA restrictions on bodywork were far less detailed than today. The designers were given a huge amount of freedom to use their ingenuity with a set of relatively simple dimension restrictions. The length, width and height of the cars was restricted along with the overhangs, but the total area allowed by the regulations gave us some insane looking F1 cars. Take this Brabham BT52 from 1983. The shape is nothing like we've seen in F1 before or since, with extremely short side pods, an arrow shaped body and radiators set way back in the car. The regulations gave designer Gordon Murray the freedom to carry out his vision. The 1983 regulations massively reduced the downforce generated by ground effects, but the car still had more than 1,000 brake horsepower to put through the rear tyres. Murray thought that the only solution to make the car drivable was to shift the weight balance as far rearward as he could. <laughs> Freedom of Article 3 in 1983 allowed him to do this, extending the car's wheelbase and fitting the radiators just ahead of the front wheels. This genius design enabled driver Nelson Piquet to win his second world championship. In the same year, Ferrari tried to do something radical too, with the 126 C3. Again, because of the insane power of the cars and the lack of ground effects, Ferrari wanted to maximise the grip at the rear to make the car drivable. But instead of chasing a rearward weight distribution like Gordon Murray, Ferrari designer Harvey Postlewaite gave the car a gigantic rear wing with extra winglets either side to produce huge downforce. The 126C3 looked insane and the radical rear wing design meant it recovered 50% of the lost downforce from the lack of ground effects. Ferrari was only able to do this because of the freedom given by the Article 3 bodywork regulations. However, these regulations were tightened up in 1994, which led to the teams trying some interesting tricks to get ahead. For 1994, the height of the bodywork behind the rear axle line was restricted. This meant that the rear wings were lower in height and unable to work as effectively as before. The front wing was also shifted backwards with the nose of the car being allowed to extend ahead. The lower bodywork at the front of the car was also moved up and away from the ground, reducing the downforce at the front. This gave the teams a dilemma. For example, with the MP410, McLaren wanted to claw back some of the downforce lost by the reduced height of the rear wing. So they got creative and came up with a mid-wing, a small additional wing added to the rear of the engine cover. It looked very strange, but the mid-wing allowed the team to regain some of the lost rear downforce. However, there was a problem. Additional downforce doesn't guarantee that you'll go faster because the aero balance of the car is just as important. This additional rear downforce shifted the car's balance, meaning the car is less willing to rotate and as a consequence, very tricky to drive. This meant that the teams were unable to strike a good aero balance when using the mid wings, so the idea was abandoned in the end. Before we continue, I've noticed that 80% of you watching these videos aren't subbed to the channel. If that's you and you watch our videos, please take a second to sub to support us. It helps keep this channel creating free content for you. Some of the most radical designs we've ever seen in F1 can be found in the 1997 season, a season that I particularly love because I've driven a lot of the cars from this year. For this season, the F FIA tightened up the Article 3 regulations even further and limited the space that designers could work with in more specific areas. The aim was to again reduce the downforce of the cars and therefore lower the cornering speeds. 
For example, the height between the bottom of the front wing and the ground was increased by 10 millimeters. This meant that a greater volume of air was allowed to flow underneath the front wing, increasing the air pressure under the front wing and reducing downforce. The FIA also marked out exclusion zones at the front and rear of the car, where designers couldn't add any downforce generating bodywork. However, as normal, designers found a loophole. These exclusion zones didn't run the entire length of the car, and that left an area around the center of the car where bodywork could be added. Not only this, this area allowed for bodywork that extended to the maximum height of the car, which led to the insane X-wings fitted to the Tyrrell 025. This was another example of a functional but not pretty solution to the problem of increasing downforce. Tyrrell didn't have the budget of the larger teams, but former Ferrari designer Harvey Postlewaite was looking for a cost-effective way to maximize downforce. His solution was the X-wings, two small winglets either side of the driver that extended up to the maximum height of the car. Because they were positioned around the center of the car, they generated useful downforce that acted around the midpoint of the car's length and didn't disrupt the aero balance. Tyrrell was so tight on budget that the x wings were actually made using old front wings. But other teams like Ferrari, Sauber, Prost and Jordan also ended up trying the idea. However, the X-Wings were soon banned on the ground that they could break off and cause an accident. But that wasn't the end of crazy wing designs in F1. In 2001, the regulations allowed designers to utilize the space above the nose of the car. The bodywork could be a maximum of 500 millimeters wide and could extend up to the 950 millimeters height of the car. And the Arrows A22 made full use of this extra freedom. The team added a huge extra wing on the top of the nose of the car, which generated additional downforce and was fully compliant with Article 3. It was a crazy idea, and while the FIA deemed it acceptable from a design perspective, they were concerned about safety. They thought that if this wing were to break off during a race and hit a car, it could cause a massive accident. More recently, the weirdest F1 designs we've seen have come from the 2014 season. This was the year that the Article 3 regulations lowered the front impact structure to a point below the front axle height. In previous years, the noses of the car were becoming extremely high in order to allow airflow to travel under the nose of the car and generate more downforce from the floor. This generated downforce, but the danger was that such a high nose could cause a fatal accident in a T-bone crash, since the nose was high enough to strike a driver's head. As a result, Article 3 was amended to lower the height of the front nose, but the designers still wanted to maximize airflow to the keel. In their efforts to do so, we saw some of the ugliest F1 cars ever made in 2014. We all remember this Catrum. The nose still looks like it's high off the ground, and Catrum did this so the airflow to the keel was maximized. However, look closer and there is an ugly prong extending from the nose and down to the FIA specified point below the front axle line. This was Catrum's way of satisfying the regulations with the prong being classed as the front impact absorbing structure and causing minimal aerodynamic disruption. We saw similar solutions with the Force India, Toro Rosso and McLaren of the same year but by far the weirdest looking F1 car of 2014 and possibly ever is the Lotus E22. Instead of the single prong, Lotus used two large tusks that extended from the nose and down below the front axle line. Again, this was to allow as much air as possible to pass through the gap between them and under the nose, working the underside of the car. Amazingly though, the nose was actually asymmetrical. The prong on the right hand side was 5.1 centimeters longer than the other. And this was because the FIA mandated that the cars could only have a single nose tip. So by definition, the longer prong is the tip of the nose even though there are two prongs. Unsurprisingly, the rules were changed in 2015 to bury these drop noses into the history books, and we're all glad about that. You should watch this video about how Renault used the nose of the car to hide a secret damper that dramatically increased the car's performance, or this other video, which I think you'll love. Thanks for watching, don't forget to sub, and I'll catch you in the next video.